Hey guys, what's up? A little update. So, some background. I am in the midst of getting myself comfortable with individual cells of a battery so that I can put together a large 48 volt battery, actually two large 48 volt batteries for the RV that I will be receiving sometime in January, probably February at this rate. And so uh, some of what's involved in that, I will quickly go over. I've covered most of this in previous videos, but just a brief review. I have a, a, a BMS. I'm going to have two of these. So um, a, a BMS or battery management system is in charge of watching each individual cell and making sure that we aren't doing anything dangerous, like pulling them down below a safe voltage, below empty, or overcharging them. So you don't want to over discharge or overcharge them. So it's watching the voltages of all of these and it's making sure that they are uh, within a certain voltage of each other. And it's making sure that you're not going to charge in the freezing weather. These are temperature sensors because lithium iron phosphate, which is this particular chemistry, it is a chemistry of lithium ion. There are different chemistries of lithium ion and lithium iron phosphate is one of the most safe chemistries to work with and it's one of the reasons it's used in mobile applications like uh, an RV um, because there's a lot less risk of fire or other sorts of uh, runaway problems uh, with these. <clears throat> so anyway, so the, the BMS has <laughs> lots of wires involved in it. Now this, this is my two original 12 volt SOK batteries that I was originally thinking of using, but as I became more and more comfortable with building my own battery, I realized I can build my own giant battery bank for a lot cheaper than these. And these are actually really good deals. $620 for a 12 volt, 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery. And uh, what I have done is I've dissected these and I've, I'm using them as my science experiment here. So anyway, so back, so we've got the, the BMS and this is a chargery brand, uh, Chargery Power BMS. And this BMS is different from a lot of others uh, because it's modul modular. So you've got sort of the brains here, you've got a display that's connected to the brains, and then you have a relay. In this case, this is a solid state relay. Uh, and the, the reason for this is if the BMS decides that there is something unsafe happening, it uses this to cut off the current. So let's pretend for a moment that these are the terminals of, of my 24 volt battery. I mean, they really are, but they don't look like it. So this, these are the terminals of my 24 volt battery. And if something goes wrong here, this is going to shut off the relay and no power will be available here. Here is just a, a fuse. These are all the, the leads that are coming in from each of the individual cells so that the BMS can know what's going on. This is the shunt and this measures current and that is connected also to the BMS. That's not strictly required. The chargery BMS, um, you know, can pay attention to current and you can tell it um, to do certain things. Like if you know current, then you can pretty accurately understand the state of charge of your battery bank. Now that's really important for lithium iron uh, phosphate uh, chemistry because what happens is the very beginning, the, the, let's say the, the when the battery is empty, the voltage uh, between say 0% and 10% increases radically, but from 10% to 90%, the voltage is almost flat. So if you were to just take a, a multimeter like this, and just measure your battery voltage, you're not really gonna get a good accurate sense of the state of charge. So one way to get a better sense of that is to measure the current going in and out of your battery and count it. We tell, the, we tell this BMS, we say, hey, this is a 24 volt, 100 amp hour battery bank. So if we pull 100 amp hours through the shunt, we know we have basically completely drained the battery. And so you can you can run your numbers based off that. You'll notice that I have another one here. This is a standalone Victron Bluetooth enabled shunt. And I have this here for my own purposes. This is what I will be using in my big 48 volt battery bank. Um, this is gonna be my main shunt that uh, is in line with both batteries. And then each, S each uh, 48 volt bank will have its own shunt as well because I'll have that 
have this BMS and that shunt hooked up to, to a 48 volt battery and then a, another duplicate of this, including this, hooked up to another 48 volt battery. Those two 48 volt batteries will combine and they will go through a single shunt so I can so I can measure the current going through the entire system. This will measure what's going through a single battery. This will measure the entire system. And so that's why I've got both of these. And, and you know, it's also uh, sort of experimentation as well and, you know, comparison, you know, what does this BMS uh, say and tell me with respect to current and, and state of charge? And what does this say? So on the phone here, I've got the Victron app loaded and that's giving me information from the, from the Victron shunt. And then here on this display, we can see the state of charge here as well. And um, yeah, so I think that covers the, you know, what this is and what I'm doing and, and all that happy stuff. So uh, I, this is a 24 volt, 100 amp hour battery bank. So that ends up being, if you do that, if you basically divide, uh, multiply 24 by 100, you end up with 2.4 kilowatt hours. And so for comparison, the battery that I'm building for the RV is 28.6 kilowatt hours. So more than 10 times larger in capacity than this. Uh, so, and it'll be 48 volts and this is 24. I don't have any way to do 48 volts right now, but this has given me some some experience. I was I was doing a 12 volt bank, and now I'm doing a doing a 24 volt bank. So I'm just using this to learn. Now, um, the SOK batteries. I'm really glad um, that I did this experiment with them instead of on the batteries that that I have yet, or the the cells rather that I have yet to receive. And I've swapped out. The, the bolts that were in here, I talked about this in a previous video, but I have a bit of an update on there. I swapped out the bolts with with studs and nuts. I see if I can get that to focus. Yeah, so I've got a I've got a stud here and I've got a nut <clears throat> that connects the, on top of that. And the reason I did this, this was actually a suggestion um, that I saw on the on the DIY solar forum and uh, that is because, for a couple of reasons, when, you, when you're putting a bolt down and you've got um, the original bolts, I don't have one here with me, but I mean, uh, this is not one of them, but this is a, uh, this is a bolt. And when you screw this in, uh, you know, it's designed, it's got, say, six or ten millimeters of length. And you can turn it, you can screw it all the way in and catch all the threads inside the cell. Now, as soon as you start doing things like putting lugs on top of it, well, now you aren't catching as many threads all the way in because the because the bolt can't go all the way in. You can compensate with larger bolts, but you have to have all different kinds of bolts, and it, it gets um, confusing, and you, you're not going to get the numbers correct, and you run the risk of screwing the bolt in too far if the bolt is too long, and all kinds of issues. And that and that is a, a, a not usually as much of a concern in most applications, but in this application, these cells are made out of aluminum. That includes the threads are, are aluminum. Aluminum is very soft and it is very easy to strip these out. And I did do that in my testing. So on the recommendation of what I saw in the forums, I instead replaced the bolts with studs. And I initially <clears throat> tried the Loctite blue because I didn't think I needed a really strong, uh, you know, lock. We're only we're only talking about seven or seven or so newton meters of torque, and I and I have a torque wrench here to to do that. You can you know this torque wrench goes up to um, what does that look like? To twenty twenty three, I think I can see on the markings there. Twenty three newton meters of force, and I've got it set to seven. Right, so seven is really not much. And that's very very easy to. To hand tighten. Anyway, I tested this out on one of the studs and I was able to very easily remove the stud after I had let this set for 24 hours. So I decided to go for red and after some research, it looked like the Permatex brand red. And this is really confusing. It's a blue bottle, but this is, per this is Permatex Threadlocker red. And I used this and I locked in all the studs and they are nice and tight. So that means that the studs aren't going to move around while I'm twisting the nut on top of them because the stud could move with this. 
And that's, uh, that's important so that you don't uh, bottom out the stud while you're tightening it. And it allows me to use the, the torque wrench on top of this nut because I, I won't be able to hold the stud in place using the Allen key on the top while I have the socket on top. So now I have a properly torque system. The threads are going all the way in, and that's not for conductivity purposes, that's just for your holding power purposes, and so I don't strip things out and I can get the proper torque. And everything has been cleaned. Uh, I basically polished the top of all the terminals to make sure there wasn't any oxidation. This is 1000 grit sandpaper. And uh, then I used some uh, deoxidizing spray to, to give them a nice uh, clean up on, on top. I assembled everything, torqued it down, and I currently have here on the BMS, you can see this value here that says 20 at the moment, that there's a 20 maximum of 20, 23 millivolts difference between the cells. So this shows the highest, the voltage of the highest voltage cell and the voltage of the lowest voltage cell. The difference between them is that number. And so, that, so that's good to watch, uh, especially when you're at a low, very low state of charge or very high state of charge because that tells you, that gives you a sense of whether or not your batteries are balanced. If you're at a high, very high state of charge, like 99% plus, and this is only 20 millivolts, um, you're doing pretty good for balance. The other thing is, I watch this, <clears throat> and that's my meter, I watch this number when I turn on the load. So let's talk about the load. I have been playing with, <clears throat> I'll show you a, a 48, this is actually a 12 volt version of, of a water heating element, uh, which you might find in RVs. And uh, this is a 12 volt, 600 watt element. And in there is a 24 volt, 900 watt element. I also happen to have a 48 volt, 1500 watt element, which I will use at some point. But anyway, I have this, <laughs> dangling into the water and I, i've done my you know reasonable amount of due diligence here for testing purposes this isn't gonna fall any further into water i'm not gonna have any sort of problems but this is the water is all the way up to the threads here and i'm gonna be able to turn this on and heat up the water i will probably have to either exchange this water or uh, put some ice in here to cool it down the last time i did this with the 12 volt 600 watt system. I did it in a slightly smaller bucket, but it got that water up to 150 and I dumped a bunch of ice in there and I still got it back up to 140 before I drained 1.2 kilowatt hours out. I now I'm going to have to drain 2.4 kilowatt hours out at a higher wattage. This is going to heat the water more quickly. So <laughs> I fully expect to have to do something here. And I realized while I was talking that I, that I, what, I, I forgot to mention something about the, the thread lock. These, at least as at least as described by Permatex, this requires at least one of the two metals that you're working with to be an active metal. And one way to test for active uh, metals is a magnetic test. So, you know, this is a stainless steel SS18 um, stud, and, you know, it's, it is magnetic. It's not strong, but it's magnetic. Aluminum, not magnetic. And, you know, I don't know if this, if that played a role in whether or not the Loctite blue was unable to hold or not, you know, if this, this needed the metal to be more active, like, like this isn't active enough or, or it's just too weak or whatever the reason is, I kind of don't care because we'll toss that in there <laughs> and we're just going to use this because I've proven that it works. So, okay. Now, one of the advantages of this solid state relay that they provide here is I have an on off switch. So, uh, I will be you know, this system is on, the BMS is happy, it's saying, you know, it's it, all the signals are a green go, but I'm not providing any power. There's zero amps as noted by the shunt for this, for the charger, and there's zero amps as noted by the Victron shunt. And that's because this is turned off. So I'll flip this switch on, that will allow current to flow, and this will start heating up the water. So let's do that. Now we've got the power light, so, so this thing is connected to the BMS and the status light is on, and that means that the BMS is telling this thing it is okay to pass current. Now if we take a look over here, we're drawing, according to this, 41 amps, and according to this, 41.7 amps. And 
you might be able to see yep, on the video, you can see evidence of heat. So we are pushing 40 amps or 1,081 watts out of the battery. We've already consumed half an amp hour here. And I'm just gonna let this test run for a while. This, this little the time remaining is pretty cool. At this particular rate, it, this takes a three minute average, so I would have to run at this rate for three minutes before this becomes accurate. But you can see it counting down. I've got now less than four hours of battery left before I hit 0%. This will likely be approximately um, two hours or, or something of, of that nature. I'd, I really don't want to do the math in my head right now. It's 2.4 kilowatt hour system. I'm drawing 1.1, so it'll probably be a little over two hours. Um, and that's that. So of note, I'm drawing, you know, what, what, 41 amps. And these cells are, you know, we can safely draw 1C. That's a pretty typical max discharge for lithium iron phosphate. So 1C would be 100 amps because it's a 100 amp hour battery. I'm drawing 0.4C, 0.41 technically, right now. And one thing to, uh, to pay attention to here is that my the difference in voltage between my cells really hasn't changed since it was off. And that is a very key indicator for how good are my connections here. And this, the second indicator too, of course, is there, is, is there any heat buildup somewhere? And I have experienced that. I was experiencing that when I was stripping up threads and having all sorts of problems with the bolts. My, my, my difference here was 100 millivolts when, it was, when this uh, was turned on and it was, 10 millivolts when this was turned off. So that told me that something was wrong. And I would feel uh, one of the bus bars was starting to get pretty warm. So something was wrong. So these are all things I now know how to, you know, what to look for, how to look for, how to fix, how to prevent and all that sort of stuff. So that's been my learning experience that I, I thought I would share with you. But I'm gonna go around, you know, and, and especially in the 48 volt system, I'm gonna be very careful about this. I don't wanna electrocute myself. It's harder, harder to do with 24 or 12 volts DC. Um, uh, but uh, I don't want to uh, electrocute myself here. So I'll just, you know, I'm going to occasionally just feel these and make sure they're basically room temperature, right? Just like this. And I could also use a, um, an infrared <clears throat> thermometer, which I have, or it would be really cool if I had like one of those uh, FLIR thermometers that would give me a nice sort of heat map of what's going on here so I can quickly detect exactly where any problems might lie. So, you know, make sure there's nothing going on here with the fuse or or here or here. You know, these are the kinds of things um, that I'm going to be doing when I do build that 48 volt battery bank. And that's going to be rather, rather difficult to, to put under full load. But I believe what I'm going to end up doing is, uh, because I have to pick up the RV out in Kansas and I'm currently in Connecticut, I'm going to ship all the batteries here. I'm gonna ship the primary electrical equipment here, and that includes a Victron 8,000 watt inverter, which is capable of peaking to 16,000 watts. So uh, I will set up that inverter so I can plug in my RV, which is, you can't see, is sitting on the other side of these, the door and the window here. And I can plug that RV into the Victron, which I'll have here. Uh, I'll, I will also plug the Victron into AC on, on the other side of the house uh, here. This is my parents' house, by the way, not mine, in, in their garage. I'm using their garage as a lab, but there's a 50-amp plug on the outside. So I'll be able to use the Victron to charge the 48-volt battery bank, and I'll be able to use my RV to discharge the 48-volt battery bank because the, I'll, I'll, I'll use the, luck, the uh, Victron as a substitute for the grid. And I'll be able to go into the the RV and turn on everything, uh, you know, as much as I can. And that'll put a significant load on that battery bank. Now those are going to be 280 amp hour cells, which means I can safely draw 280 amps at 24 volts. And that is a heck of a lot of wattage. I'm not going to come anywhere uh, near that. Uh, I will, you know, I'll be able to draw, you know, six, 7,000 watts, no problem. And that's, you know, that's going to be a pretty rare occurrence. So 150, 200 amps, I could maybe peak it to 250 amps for a short period of time. But anyway, the whole point of all of this is I'll be able to do a nice long uh, load test 
on the battery bank that I build and make sure that I, d I don't have any hot spots or anything dangerous going on. And I'll be able to uh, charge that 48 volt battery bank without waiting for a very long time. In fact, that'll be the only way I can do it as a 48 volt battery bank because this thing is only capable of pushing out 32 amps. If you watched my previous video, by the way, I had a solar charge controller here that I was using in combination with this to charge these as a 20, as a 12 volt bank. I'm unable to do so as a 24 volt battery bank because uh, th the voltage of this needs to be at least five volts higher than the battery bank. And the battery bank can be 27, 28, you know, 29.2 when it's full under charge. And that's not a, you know, that's not a five volt difference from 32 volts. So the solar charge control, at least the Victron, is, is unable to do its thing. And so I've, uh, I've had to bypass the uh, solar charge controller and kind of go do the old school method. Just took, you know, set this to 29.2 volts and hook it directly to the battery bank. One last thing I want to note that I did here, and, and it is very important to do if you're building a new battery bank, I will be doing, and I did it here um, off camera the last uh, couple of days, I hooked all of those cells up in parallel. Now they're in series right now, and that gets you the, the 24 volts, but when they're in parallel, they're 3.2 uh, 3 volts nominal, uh, and you charge them to 3.65 to get them to absolute full. And when you do that in parallel at the same time, charge them to 3.65, and um, you're, you're doing what's called top balancing the batteries. And you wanna, you'll want to do that so that when you charge and discharge them as a battery bank, in this, uh, in this sort of scenario, all of the cells will fill up you know, and be at the same state of charge as you get to full. If any of them are out of balance with each other, one cell is going to get the full, the other cell is going to be down here. This is going to go you know, above with the BMS, like it's going to go above 3.65. The BMS is going to go, oh, that's bad, and it's going to shut down the battery bank, which you don't want to happen, but it's a, it's a good safety mechanism, all because your cells are out of balance. So it's really important to get your cells balanced up like that. So I know I dispute a lot of information in a short period of time. Um, I, you know, If you're really into, into batteries, uh, I do recommend... Will Prowse uh, and his uh, his forums and his videos. He has a book on Amazon I haven't actually read yet, but uh, most of what I've learned has actually come through um, the forums and the videos that he's posted up. So I'll make sure that there's a link in the description. I will link, put a link uh, into the uh, description also for the for the BMS. There's different versions of this. This this particular version is capable if you plug in another one of these it is capable of connecting to 16 cells you know 16 times 3.2 is 48 volts so that's that's why i have this bms that's capable of having two of these connected in order to monitor a, monitor a 16 cell system but what's really nice about this bms is it can monitor anywhere from a 2 to 16 cell system most bms's you buy exactly what you need to monitor so if you've got a 24 volt bank, which is eight cells, you buy an eight cell BMS and that's all it can do. This is, this is flexible and is allowing me to test a four cell config, an eight cell config, and ultimately the 16 cell config that I'm going, going to buy. Um, you should note that if you're anything less than an eight cell configuration, you need to plug the BMS into an external power source um, so that the BMS uh, can function. It, it needs at least um, an eight cell config in order to be self-powered or powered by the battery that it's monitoring. Um, there are different options for the size of the BMS. Go with as, uh, with enough headroom, maybe 25% headroom, but go with the, as small of a shunt as you can. So if you're only gonna draw 100 amps, you don't wanna be buying a 600 amp shunt uh, like this. I think this is a 600 amp shunt um, because it's gonna be more accurate to have a, have a smaller shunt. Similarly, this is a 300 amp, uh, their, this is their DC contactor, their solid state contactor. You can use a relay, you can do all kinds of stuff here. Um, they have a 600 amp version and they've got, I think a 200 and a 100 amp version of this as well. So again, size this appropriately, um, but you know, make sure you're giving yourself enough headroom um, so that you're not operating at 100% of its capacity for any period of time. And also to give you some room for surges, like you know, turning on a, uh, an air conditioner or something that might draw a lot of power when you first turn it on. So, okay. If you are curious about 
the Chargery in more detail, like, you know, going through the menu and, and setup and stuff like that, you can go to one of my recent previous videos. It's all been related to the SOK batteries. And uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna we'll take a quick peek here. We can see that I'm still drawing 41 amps. It's only 20 millivolts of difference. The Victron shows I've pulled 7.4 amp hours. I've got two hours and 14 minutes left. And so this says, you know, 91%. This started at 98, so this says 91%. That started at 100% because it wasn't calibrated, and it, and it said 93 just a second ago. So these are currently actually agreeing with each other if we if we compensate for the fact that they started that they started at different numbers. And you know, we've got some fun action here. This is, yep, yeah, that water's pretty hot at the top. So I'll be giving that a stir to <laughs> keep the temperature under control, but. That's my current cheap load test. These things are like, I think, 30 bucks. So this was a nice, cheap way to um, to, to dump a lot of load and uh, safely into water. If you try to do this with an air-cooled system or something like that, that would be harder to do. You'd have to have heat sinks and fans and stuff like that. So this this was a really nice and simple way for me to do a, a load test because I don't have a 24-volt inverter or yet a 48-volt inverter. I don't even have a, a good, large 12-volt uh, inverter. Um, so, unfortunately, you have to have an inverter that matches the voltage of your battery bank. So I didn't want to buy three different <laughs> high-powered inverters um, to do a load test. That's that's certainly going to be expensive, of course. So, all right. I'm not going to um, bother coming back and following up the video with, you know, what happened at the end of the test here. I've done enough tests with these batteries to know that I'm going to get 100 amp hours out of them. So unless I get less than that, um, you know, I, I'm not gonna do a follow-up video. Um, uh, and uh, even if it is less than that, I'll just leave it in the comment, in the, in the description of the video. So take a look there. And again, I'll link everything in. And as always, I'm happy to answer any questions, take any comments. If you've got stuff you wanna see me do, if you want more information about something, uh, if you got suggestions for me, I'm all ears. I want to serve you as best as I can and give you all the information you, uh, you'd you want. So, all right, signing off. Thanks for watching and as always, stay safe.